prepare to die. <laughs> Hey what's happening gamers, welcome back to another Retro Mondays, where the goal of this show is to turn your Monday into a fun day, fun day, fun day. Yeah I know, parody. Yes, there was an M-rated warning. This doesn't mean I'm gonna turn into a cussing buffoon or anything like that, but it does mean that this game, even though it's old, it's pretty gory. So viewer discretion is strongly advised, because heads will literally roll. Mortal Kombat was a realistic arcade fighting game that released in 1992 by Midway and was published by Acclaim. Its sequel released in the arcades the following year and then the fall of 94 it graced the consoles too. Now MK2 was a favorite of mine, but I wasn't allowed to own it. Still this game and WWF and Mario Kart made for some really fun sleepovers when I was younger. My favorite character to play as was Sub-Zero when I was a kid, so uh, pardon the expression, but Sub-Zero was cool. Some people may not know this, but Mortal Kombat has a very rich plot. So our story picks up after the events of the first game. The sorcerer has been defeated by Liu Kang of Earthrealm. Shao Kahn spares Sang Tsung and restores his youth, and challenge the Earth to Mortal Kombat, and warp the Earth Warriors to Outworld. If Earth loses, all hope for the realms will be lost. Believe it or not, Mortal Kombat has been the dread of many parents back in the early 90s. The victories in this series were very different from that of Street Fighter or other fighters. Instead of just knocking out your opponent, you had the option of giving them an eternal dirt nap. It's because of games like this and Splatterhouse that we have the ESRB today. All of the fighters return from Mortal Kombat 1, but only 7 are playable. Oro, Kano, and Sonya Blade appear as non-playable characters or in cameos only. However, the chained up Sonya Blade was originally supposed to be a fighter in this game, but Minbuei was trying to compete with Street Fighter, so she was dropped from the roster in favor of two new female fatales. Katana, Princess of Outworld, and Shao Kahn's assassin, Melina. Also joining the two deadly ladies are three other characters, Baraka, Kung Lao, and Jax. Players can go through the tournament mode, which isn't as easy as you may think. You can also face off against a friend in co-op to the death. The gameplay has been tweaked just a little bit since the last time, along with the visuals. Fighting still involves high and low punches and kicks, but characters don't feel as stiff and there are additional moves for each fighter too. The key example for this is Sub-Zero's ground freeze ability, love that. Fatalities make a triumphant return, but we also have two new additions to join the franchise, friendships and babalities. Instead of destroying your foe, you're given the choice to finish them off or show them kindness. It was later revealed that the reason these were in this game was to soften the violence for Mortal Kombat. Same with the inclusion of turning other fighters into little babies. With that out of the way, let's talk about the things that I couldn't stand about this game. While the friendships and babalities were all fine and dandy and very interesting, the developers made them very difficult to pull off. The only way you could spare your enemy is only using high or low kicks the final round. Some of you may be thinking that was pretty clever for its day, but the reason that Boone and company did this was to stick it to the censors as a joke. This used to drive me nuts as a kid because while the finishing moves were all listed, how to do the secret finishers remained known to very few. And that really bugged me. It wasn't until sites like GameFAQs came about in 1995 that these moves were easier to learn off the internet. One thing that really bothered me about Mortal Kombat until many years later was that the developers would just use palette swaps in order to create new characters. This was very apparent in Ultimate Mortal Kombat 3, by the way, with all the different ninjas and female characters. The only way one could distinguish the actual differences between the characters was their finishing moves, yet all of the friendships remain virtually the same, as do the regular attacks. I always found that very lame. 
I'm not gonna lie to you folks, the difficulty is another thing that has been holding this game back. This and the original were known for punishing and frustrating encounters when facing the enemy. Some of the bosses were insanely difficult and drove many gamers to tears. While I'm on this mini rant, another pet peeve of mine would be that there's no stage selection. Now this was very common in fighting games in the 90s and even in the early 80s, but I just found that very frustrating because I would want to pick a stage and it was all random. I hated that. What is the deal with that? My final issue with this game actually comes down to its music. Now while I enjoy the ambient tunes as much as the next guy, this is one original soundtrack that could have benefited from rockier music because the tunes are just there. They don't really add anything to the gameplay. They don't complement anything. They don't add to the emotion of the level. They're just there. As Total Biscuit would say, time to move on to the dessert for this video. Let's start with the graphics, always fun. For an SNES port of the arcade game, this game looks incredible and much better than the first Mortal Kombat port. Also, you guys and gals are probably noticing that Nintendo did not censor out the blood this time around. However, they did add a warning on the front of the box to alert parental units of its content, which I think was a good idea. All the environments have rich textures and each stage is packed with so much detail. Likewise, the character sprites have also been beefed up for the SNES version and looked great for an arcade port. Although it wasn't until the 32X release of this game that the graphics really stood out. My favorite stages for this game are the Deadpool, the Sky Palace, and of course the Living Forest. I can still remember all the hidden characters appearing here too and also the faces on the trees always freaked me out as a kid. However, I do have to say that the biggest things going for this game is three things. The gameplay, all the little easter eggs and fan service, and the story. I loved how great the controls were for this game, it was so easy to pick up and play compared to the last game. After being spoiled with Street Fighter 2, I was very picky about what other fighting games I would play. Mortal Kombat's pacing was much slower and the moves were seriously lacking. That was until its sequel. All of your favorite characters got a much needed improvement and even more moves to add to the roster. Instead of one finishing move for every character, now you had an extra one, plus some even had three. Also, don't forget that each fighter was able to do a stage fatality on three stages. Multiplayer is definitely what made the gameplay shine though, and made this a must-play game with your buddies. This is just one of those games that I really like to play with my friends, but uh, only if we were listening to hair metal bands like Striper and Guns N' Roses while playing this game. Trust me, it made the matches even more exciting. Over the years, I've really come to respect Ed Boon and his team for all the hidden easter eggs that they've been able to throw in their games. Because I don't want this episode to run too long, I will not be talking about every single easter egg that this game has to offer, and trust me, there is a lot. First and foremost, I can't forget to mention either. This happens randomly during the game after a series of excellent uppercuts. Dan Forden appears and went on to use this line in most of the Mortal Kombat games, but not all of them. Dan is also how players fight Smoke. While fighting at the portal, if you see Dan come up and say his trademark line, quickly hold down and press start. If you've done this right, then you'll be transported to face Smoke. Jade is also another hidden character, and you have to do another complex combination to fight her. Same with the original Sub-Zero, now known as Noob Sabat whom you can only actually face after winning 50 rounds in two-player mode. Which isn't fair because in the Sega Genesis version, it is only 25 wins. While these characters first appeared in Mortal Kombat 2, it wasn't until Mortal Kombat 3 and Ultimate Mortal Kombat 3 that they became playable. The last thing that I really liked about this game was its story. Unlike many fighting games, Mortal Kombat has a lot of character depth to it, and actually Midway carried these characters until Armageddon where it wiped everyone out. I mean, I'm still amazed that they were able to carry the stories that long. That's some serious great writing over on Midway's part. And it was nice to see the characters, like, progress over the years. So, how well does Mortal Kombat 2 stack up? The game's difficulty in single player will probably induce geek rage a lot. Multiplayer is a lot of fun, and there are lots of finishing moves for you to learn and master. Also, not a lot of complex uh, combos that you need to bother with either. In terms of lasting appeal, well, in its heyday, this was one of the most successful fighters in its series. So much so that people were actually stealing arcade chips out of the machine to go home and play it. That says a lot right there. 
The console ports happened a lot faster than previously so that they could prevent a lot of the theft. Ed Boon has also said in the past that Mortal Kombat 2 was the most unique of the series. In fact, for Mortal Kombat 9, the series picks up right after Mortal Kombat 2 and then goes straight into Mortal Kombat 3. So in a sense, you're getting like the whole trilogy on one game. That's pretty awesome. To this day, Mortal Kombat 2 is revered by fans like me as the greatest in the series. We'll see how uh, Mortal Kombat 9 does. Personally, I really like Mortal Kombat 2, and if you're old enough to play M-rated games, this is definitely a great classic that I recommend you play. Well, that wraps up another Retro Monday. Join me next time as I take a look at NHL Stanley Cup for the Super Nintendo, kicking off on May 2nd, because I need to finish up Zelda 2 for the game station. As some of you may know, I don't really like today's sports games. I kind of like the whole arcade approach when I was little. That in this game was just a lot of fun to play with my sister. Finally, if you're new to my stuff, why not subscribe because it's free to you and I really appreciate your support. Thanks so much for taking the time to watch this and until we meet again gamers, God bless and happy gaming.